OK, so this is a picture. We call it a LumaScape diagram in the business world. And there are lots and lots of these LumaScapes. And it turns out in Silicon Valley, if your student goes for an interview and they can't explain what different pieces of the LumaScape are, it becomes increasingly difficult to get a job. So I figure that's one of the good things we do at business school is tell people where you sit in that LumaScape. And so this is just one of the simplest ones you can find for FinTech. There are many more complicated ones. But if you want to place the particular business you're in, in the FinTech space, you want to go look at one of these diagrams and ask yourself whether you should be in that diagram or not and where in that diagram you should be. Okay, So these are just some of the areas, but, but it's kind of a nice way to look at this. Uh, it turns out there's some data on fintech. And depending on how you measure it, you get different answers. But this is one reliable version. And uh, there are about 1,400 fintech companies right now in the, in the US. And they've totally gotten about $33 billion in funding. The funding number doesn't increase very rapidly because a lot of these companies actually bootstrap. And so actually, it's not a funding intensive system. And the resources you need to run a fintech startup actually don't, don't require a lot of money. So, so we're seeing. Compared to the fact that the losses from credit card fraud are about $31 billion a year. So if you just saved fraud, uh, you could pay for a lot of the fintech startups that you actually have in place already. The adoption rates vary by country. Uh, I was surprised when I saw this for the first time, but it kind of makes intuitive sense now because Hong Kong has always been pretty good at ad adopting technology. And a lot of the finance companies, especially the small ones there, are rapidly adopting it as well. And uh, some of this is from a paper which I've referenced here, which you can always grab uh, if needed. OK, so if you had to make an argument for uh, why FinTech is sort of going to be an important sort of play, I think Thomas Philippman's paper in 2016 on FinTech is sort of a good way to start. And what he's done is gone back into the 1800s and tried to do a calculation of what financial intermediaries actually pick up in terms of their takings as part of the face value of all the business they generate. And it turns out to be roughly about 2%. That's been pretty constant over time, and uh, with a few dips and, and, and movements. But from 1880 onwards all the way out to now, uh, measured in a couple of different ways using slightly different data, Tomas gets basically the same answer. Okay, It's about 2%. And that's a pretty expensive proposition. So uh, his, his idea is that we're going to see a lot of disruption, because if you even looked at, say, robo-advising, uh, firms like Betterment and Wealthfront are offering the same services about 25 basis points now. So you're taking down the cost by about one eighth, uh, down to about one eighth, and that's going to make a big difference. And in fact, if you weren't convinced, uh, hopefully Cam's presentation of the morning convinced you that we're going to digitally sort of restructure this industry and, and reduce the cost of contracting even further. Uh, the employment numbers will also change over time. Uh, we have that interesting phenomenon where the services industry in the US has grown bigger and bigger and bigger over time uh, compared to manufacturing and agriculture. And, and the banking and financial services sector went up to about 6.5. And obviously, in the crisis, you got a little bit of a dip. It's again come back up, but it's sort of a speculation as to whether this will continue and whether we're going to actually see uh, any more employment in that sector. I'm going to show you lots and lots of examples, maybe, where, where this will get disrupted. OK, so just to get you started, if you just wanted to come up with different examples, of the benefits of sort of analytics and various other things for big banks, a lot of what's happening in fintech, I'm going to argue today, is actually coming out of theory. And it's coming out of theory that's using better techniques, uh, better models in statistics, better models in computer science to actually make these changes. But there's also better hardware on which all of this is running. Uh, this is just a small laundry list of different places where people start uh, looking as a bank. A lot of banks in Asia, for example, and this list was created by uh, the CEO of DBS, the biggest bank in Singapore. And uh, they basically asked me, you know, we've got all this data and we've got all these customers. We do nothing with the data that we have. It's, it's, we're leaving money on the table. What can we do with it? And so this is sort of a quick list that we actually came up with. Okay, So just monitoring corporate buzz. How do we actually monitor that? Uh, it requires natural language processing and a whole bunch of big data collection. Uh, how do you detect, analyze, understand profitable customers? That's a marketing problem in a finance house. Uh, we've got lots and lots of technology for that. Roughly about two-thirds of machine learning products today uh, roll out in the, in the marketing sector, not that much in the finance sector. And so we're seeing slow catch-up taking place simply because as an industry, we've always been a little more circumspect about jumping onto new technologies. Uh, you have new client targeting. That's a big, big, big plus. Uh, customer retention. Insurance companies, for example, spend a lot of time figuring out how to retain a customer. What's interesting is that we've learned that the biggest uh, sort of attrition of customers takes place at the time of contract renewal. So once you get a new contract, you look at it and say, whoops, these guys raised, raised rates on me. I'm going to go shopping. 
And it's become really easy now because insurance companies have 20, 30 years of history and a data set which says which customers jumped ship and which didn't. And we know exactly what the characteristics of those customers are. You can fit n number of machine learning models to that and figure out who's got a high price elastic and who doesn't. And we're just beginning to do that. Okay, so it's, so it's kind of really effective. Uh, there's plenty of stuff happening in prediction. I'm going to actually try and show you an application that hedge funds are running today to predict the index. Uh, you can actually predict it quite successfully. It brings into question whether market efficiency as we know it in academia is still something that we rely on or not. Uh, risk management is another area. There's plenty of large data applications to pick up risk management signals across different types of data sets. And so corpuses of risk management data are actually being collected right now. And in the US, for example, the OFR has been tasked to do this. And this has been going for a while, may not be as successfully as we might want it to be. But it's taking its, taking its time, it'll happen. Okay? Uh, there's many, many others, so I won't get into all of these. But uh, there's, there's plenty of different things, and I'll try and show you some applications as we go along. So these are my 10 areas in which I think we can sort of categorize FinTech. They're not exactly mutually exclusive. They overlap with each other as well. But there's a lot of work going on in machine learning, AI, and deep learning, which is being implemented for trading algorithms. So I'll give you some sense of that. Uh, network models are proving to be very effective. Uh, we're using it right now for systemic risk modeling in different countries. I'll show you some applications for that. Personal and consumer finance. This is all the robo-advising work that's going on right now as well as a whole bunch of other things, including uh, you know, payments and so on and so forth. Uh, you've got payment and funding systems down there as well. ICOs is an example of a funding system that's, that's a fintech-based funding, funding opportunity. Now casting. Now casting is something macroeconomists are doing. Finance houses are now using now casting to drive trading algorithms. So it's real-time forecasts, uh, not waiting for macroeconomic forecasts that come out once a quarter to get backfilled, get updated, and so on and so forth. Uh, plenty of work going on in cybersecurity. It turns out you can actually model cybersecurity applications now as portfolios of IP addresses. And so finance houses basically have natural skill sets in this area and can actually do this better. Uh, so there's, there's things like that happening. Uh, we have uh, automated high frequency trading, which is old. It's been there for a while. We won't get into nine because we've already seen too much of that today. And then we've got uh, some text uh, analytics and NLP, which I'm going to talk about tomorrow, so I won't say much about it today as well. OK. Let me quickly run through some of the cases that we are already seeing in the finance industry. Uh, there's a huge employment attrition taking place. In fact, if you're surprised that finance houses aren't hiring, uh, some of it is because of AI and deep learning. Okay, so, so what exactly is this AI thing? In the old days, we had rule-based AI. We taught a machine to follow some rules. So basically, that was automation. It replicated what the human would do, and so you took the human out of the equation, but it was just copying what the human did. We wrote code that replicated what humans did. Now we have data-driven AI. So this is new generation AI. And you basically take masses of data, and you train an algorithm to actually do something smart with that data, like categorize an index as going up or down, categorize a customer as going to leave or not, uh, decide what portfolios you want to put together with that, with that data that you have. And all you're doing is a training an algorithm that learns by itself on preceding data. Data-driven AI is much more powerful simply because it's not bounded by human logic, which was previously encoded into algorithms. Now you can actually teach the algorithm to do better than what the human can do, because the algorithm can learn from experience in a weekend, which would take us about 10 years of experience to learn. So a chess playing computer, for example, plays a million games against itself on a weekend and has a much better knowledge of chess or all possible configurations it might see than what we would do by playing ourselves. Okay? So, so companies are now beginning to sort of implement this sort of thing. And if you want to ask one question as to what sorts of jobs in the finance industry are going to remain and which ones are not going to remain, the answer is simply, if your job generates data that allows the algorithm to learn from the data that you generated, your job's going to be on the line. Okay? Simplest example is large houses that have financial analysts. I worked with one such company. Every news report for every firm is assigned to two analysts that cover that firm. The analysts score that and decide a buy, hold, or sell recommendation. So they've collected digitally every news article or every issuance of or press release that the company might have. And we have the two scores from each of the analysts. It's trivial to actually train an algorithm to figure out what these analysts are doing. And that job's going to be gone pretty soon. Uh, trading jobs is another area where you can actually watch market flow. You have, if you're collecting all that data and you know what the trader was responding with, you can actually train the algorithm to, to do what the trader does. Okay? So 
the big hedge funds are basically removing a whole bunch of these things. Traders tend to have emotions and are not predictable a lot of the time and often make mistakes. A, a machine actually won't do that. Of course, just like self-driving cars, you can train an algorithm to trade like a trader and filter out all the mistakes the traders are doing just the way the self-driving cars do as well. Uh, in the primary equity shop that Goldman runs, they only have two out of 600 equity traders left. Okay, so that's a, that's a huge drop off and uh, they're replacing people with engineers. Uh, I think what you're gonna see eventually is that finance houses will become technology companies to a large extent because of, of the way FinTech is actually taking which direction it's going. Uh, Gartner had this uh, survey where they said that about 2020, by 2025% of all economic transactions will be handled by autonomous software. I suspect it's gonna be a lot more than that. I don't think it's, it's that far away, okay? And then you're gonna have a whole bunch of things that's, that's happening with contextual awareness where people are gonna be helped with their savings and so on. Uh, I'm on the investment committee for betterment and we kind of spend a lot of time looking at these sorts of things uh, to try and get this to be an AI driven system. Uh, cross selling, there's something called categorization as a service now. You don't actually have to build these tools yourself. The tech companies are actually providing you the tools to do this. So if you wanted to segment your customers and you wanted to send your data to Amazon for example to do this for you, uh, you can actually call up a service that does that. You don't have to build the hardware platform to do it. You don't have to build a software engine to do this. You can actually send it over there directly. So if you have any sort of application that actually builds on top of recognition or large data processing, uh, it automatically goes there and comes back. Okay, so to just, just to give you a good example of this, Amazon has an Im image recognition package now, which is an API. You have a picture, you send it to Amazon, it comes back and it tells you who's in the picture, how many people, what their emotions are, by reading faces. So Paul Ekman, about 50 years ago in San Francisco, uh, had actually come up with five or six readings of a face, which translated into eight emotional states. Amazon pretty much replicates that thing for you and does it in a second. So you get hotel companies, for example, at the check-in desk, you walk in, it scans your face, and immediately figures out you're tired and emotional. And it sends a little thing to the front desk computer saying, offer this guy a massage because he needs it, and he's likely to do that. <laughs> okay, so, so you have poker playing programs that right now just watch uh, the, the, the hands, but they can act also watch your face as well, and so on and so forth. Okay, so, so there's plenty of that going on. Uh, Pepper, for example, is, is something that walk, walks around the lobby of this Japanese bank, and it sort of looks at everybody's faces and figures out who's the most tired and cranky customer in the lobby at that point in time, walks up to the customer and engages that customer to try and you know, manage a customer service. Okay, and there are many, many, many others here. In fact, you mentioned P2P, and we're getting a lot of overlays of AI on top of P2P. So it's not just that the transaction's gonna be done machine to machine, but we're actually gonna see uh, whether the transaction will get done is gonna be decided by, by AI in the, in the first place. Okay, uh, the lawyer's jobs are at stake as well. There's a whole bunch of contract verification that's now currently completely being automated, so we're just getting rid of Lawyer. So this is one of these Bloomberg articles where COIN, which is something that JP Morgan uh, implemented, so they've kind of taken away a lot of that uh, legal, legal paperwork. Uh, hedge funds. Hedge funds are the ones really investing. So BlackRock uh, has replaced a lot of stock being with human algorithms. Uh, Sentient was a company that actually was invested in Emma, which is a software that used to write news articles, and they're actually now using it to generate sort of tradable cues and so on and so forth. A numerizer hedge fund that's sitting on top of the Ethereum blockchain. And what it does is it allows people to create trading algorithms, and then people can invest in these trading algorithms. The people who created those algorithms actually get paid in numeraire, which is a token on the Ethereum blockchain for, for these payments. Okay, so, uh, so that's just some, an application on top of, on top of Ethereum. Uh, what's happening really right now is there's not that much data about the track record of these, these hedge funds. And so the business is sort of a little bit secretive. And people are also really worried about handing over money. It's sort of a psychological problem of handing over money completely to a machine. So you still need some human there who's the front end for the machine now that's actually gonna be, gonna be doing this, okay? So these are challenges. Of course, security is another big challenge. We've had recently a fair amount of hacking that's taken place of these things on the blockchain. And so that's something else that people worry about because millions get lost in a second and it's pretty hard to retrieve it given the blockchain is pretty immutable. And uh, the last time that happened, they had to fork it to sort of get the money back and, and that wasn't convenient. 
Okay, this is an interesting graphic simply because it tells you that machine learning funds are actually doing a lot better than the other hedge funds out there right now. Okay, and so what I want to do is spend a little bit of time trying to give you some idea of, uh, of where we are going with this technology and why these machine learning funds are actually performing much better with AI uh, than the other funds that use sort of human, uh, human decided uh, trading algorithms. Okay, so the story behind this is neural networks and uh, Many of you might have seen what a neural network is. It's pretty simple. It's, you've got a bunch of inputs over here. You pass them through a first set of neurons. These neurons are nothing but squashing functions. They take a bunch of inputs, weight the inputs into something called a net input. The net input then goes into some sort of a function. It could be a logit function or any other kind of function you like. There were five or six candidate functions everybody uses, and it spits out an output. That output goes into another bank of functions here another bank of functions that keeps transforming the initial input through various layers until you finally get to the output layer. And the output layer over here, or the output neuron, decides whether you should buy or sell, for example. Okay? You don't have to have just one output neuron. You could have a range of output neurons, each of them being the probability of some action. And so if you had five different things, and let's say you were training this neural network to be an analyst, it would give you strong buy, weak buy, neutral, strong sell, weak sell. Okay? This technology has been around since the 60s and got mathematically much better in the 80s. Okay, so it's old technology. The problem with this is that for every input over here, whoops, for every input here, you have a bunch of weights on this neuron. So if there are four here, for example, you've got four weights here plus an interceptor bias term, so you get five parameters. And there's a whole bunch of these times this. You get a bunch of parameters in here, then all these times all these gives you another bunch of parameters. And so you might end up with two, three million parameters and overfit the heck out of this thing. And so there's a whole bunch of things that computer scientists have done to sort of manage the overfitting as well. But by and large, what it's really picking up, and if there's only one story to tell here, it is that most of our econometric methods so far have been simple things like linear models or simple transforms of linear equations, like a logit, for example. And those things may not pick up nonlinearities that you have in the data. Neural networks are actually allowing you to pick up severe nonlinearities in the data. So when we tested for market efficiency in the old days, we checked for autocorrelation, for example. We did variance ratio tests. These were all sort of linear functions that were being tested. But there's a whole space of functions where predictability might actually be present, which you will not pick up if you're only testing the space of linear functions. And so the neural network technology is actually allowing you to do that. The other thing it's allowing you to do, for example, is take much more data than you have and pass it through these networks than you were able to do before with simple models. Because simple models, we had to design an econometric specification. And even though we designed it to take a lot of data, we weren't able to take all the data and just throw it at it in an atheoretic fashion. So this thing is pretty atheoretic at this point. We're actually running these networks without too much theory, but they seem to work really well. And we're finding matches between this problem and lots of other problems in the physical world that are identical. So finance problems can then be recast in terms of another physical problem that a physicist might be solving, and we then get sort of the same ideas and, and intuitions. It turns out to fit this sort of a network, you need to actually find the weights, optimal weights on each and every parameter. If you have two million weights, for example, that's a lot of weights to fit. And you can't do that by just taking numerical gradients. But in, 19, in the 1980s, we had the backpropagation algorithm and that's all the math you need. It's just implement, large scale implementation of vectorized implementation of the chain rule in calculus. And all you're doing is figuring out what the weights actually are. It's one pass forward through the network and one pass back. You get all the weights so that you can actually recalculate the weights instantly if you have a vectorized machine. And this is all being done on chips now that do this a lot faster than we used to be able to do before. OK, so we can feed this a lot of data. So three things are happening. One is we've got a lot more data than we had before. Second is, the mathematics has come together very nicely, so we can actually run all this in different configurations with very much the same mathematics. And third, you actually have hardware now that supports this very efficiently. So Google doesn't run this anymore on CPUs or GPUs. In fact, it runs it on TPUs, which are tensor processing units, which are designed specifically for these sorts of calculations. OK, so what I want to do is I want to sort of show you a canonical example from the neural nets literature, which can be mapped directly into a financial problem. And then you can use that to solve or predict the markets uh, very efficiently. I'm going to run that code and kind of show it to you as well. Okay? So 
this is just a screenshot from one of the pages at Numeri. But what's interesting over here is this piece in the middle. So way back, uh, Jan LeCun, who's actually the head of AI at Facebook now, uh, he set up this problem, which is digit recognition. This is a standard problem your ATM solves for you. Every time you stick a check in there, it, it reads off the digits and figures out what the ones, twos, and threes are. So there are 10 different things it, can, it, it has to decide between. There are 10 digits. But the digits are written in any arbitrary fashion by hand, and so you've got to get pretty good at figuring out what this is. So the way this is done is by trying to sort of figure out what uh, the pixels are, and then feeding the pixels as the right-hand side of a regression where the left-hand side is a big multinomial logit with 10 numbers, okay, if you just want to think of it in standard econometric terms. Now, every finance problem, to a large extent, can be a classification problem can be categorized like this. If I just feed a bunch of pixels, some image, some signature of what the markets are at at any point in time, and the signature could be based on thousands of pieces of data, as long as I have a signature, then I can feed it into a neural network that will then decide, based on that signature of the markets at that point in time, what's going to happen two days out, three days out, 30 days out. Okay, so it's the same problem. In the medical sciences, we also do a lot of this because you take pictures of cells uh, for cancer, for example, and the accuracy rates now to, to sort of measure whether you have a malignancy or not, automated by a machine, are well into the 98, 99% accuracy levels. Okay, so, so I'm, I'm gonna quickly try and show you some of that. So this is just the Python notebook with, uh, with, with, some, with some data that I'm gonna pull in. But really speaking, what I'm going to argue is that the deep learning and AI that's being used in finance is nothing but a replication of what's happening in the medical sciences and in the image rec recognition space uh, applied in a finance domain where we sort of recast the data that we have into that space, and it's nothing but a pattern recognition problem. Okay? So, so if you go ahead and run this, what I'll do first is just run the cancer data set. So I've read in my math libraries. I'm going to read in a breast cancer data set. This is from the Wisconsin Medical School. And it turns out uh, once the, uh, the cell uh, biopsy has been taken, it goes under the microscope. Previously, a human being would read it and put nine numbers against it. Okay, the nine numbers are the cell thickness, cell size, cell shape, uh, various uh, bits and pieces of medical information. And then the last column tells me whether I've got a benign, uh, uh, you know, benign or, or malignant cell. Okay, so this is just the data here. And you can see different sizes and different characters. A very small little data set. It's not really very big. I'm going to convert that, the benign and malignant, into binary. So it's 0, 1. 0 for benign, 1 for malignant. And then I'm going to read in uh, the uh, neural network libraries. The reason I'm doing this also is to show you how commoditized this has become. You don't even need to know really the insides of a neural network engine. But it's completely commoditized. I read in Keras. Keras is reading something called TensorFlow. TensorFlow is Google's uh, toolkit for, for neural network fitting. And you can download it. It's open source and install it in about five minutes, and then just start feeding things to it. Okay, So everything's in there. I just have to reshape the data a little bit. That's been done. And I set up my neural net like this. I basically said that I'm going to feed in all my data. So the nine inputs. That those are measurements of the cancer cell. I'm going to feed it into three banks of 32 neurons each. And then it's going to spit out at the end whether it's malignant or benign. And I'm going to use different optimizers, because what it's doing is really minimizing a loss function, which is the difference between the right prediction and the wrong prediction. So it's, 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 it's very straightforward. Uh, so I'll just read in the model. Now, it's done nothing. It's not run the model, because I've just set it up. And then in one line of code, I'm going to run it. Now, the way I'm running it is, I'm passing it all the data for the nine inputs for a whole bunch of cancer cells. On the left-hand side, I know whether they were malignant or benign. And I'm going to run 25 epochs. What that means is every time I figure out the direction in which I should be moving the weights on each of those neurons, the way it should be done is I change the weight a little bit and see which direction my loss function goes so I know which direction to move my weights. That direction or the gradient direction is determined automatically by this backpropagation algorithm we saw before except that I don't move it a lot. I move it a little bit at a time because I don't want to sort of overshoot. And so I have a learning rate attached to this. And the learning rate is already encoded in there. And I can just repeat this exercise as many times as I want. I run it only 25 because if I run it for 100, it might go all the way to getting the thing to the total minimum in sample. And then out of sample, it'll perform really badly. I, I overfit. Because with gazillion parameters, I'm going to overfit for sure if I'm not too careful about that. So I'm only going to run 25 epochs. This is a small problem. 
uh, on the weakest laptop that Apple sells. So, so it's running all the epochs, and you can see the accuracy levels are getting better and better as I go on the validation. And I'm done. Over here, I'm just going to run on a small data set. And it's basically, of the 438 cells that were benign, it got only three wrong. And of the 245 cells that were malignant, it basically got nine wrong. So that's about 98, 99% accuracy. That, by the way, is a lot higher accuracy level than a doctor currently is able to do. Okay, two doctors in parallel probably get up to that accuracy when you have one opinion followed by a second. The same thing's happening with radiologists and so on. And if you think replace doctor with stock picker, you got the same analogy, basically. Okay? And, and if you feed data to the machine, it can do that. The digit recognition problem is even more interesting because this ties directly to the market prediction problem. That's the MNIST data set. Every digit over here is one row of the data set. The pixel over here is a 28 by 28 pixel frame. Okay, so I have 28 across, 28 down. And the number in each pixel goes from 0 to 255, depending on how dark my handwriting in that particular little pixel is. So if I pass that to my neural network and ask it to figure out whether it's a 0, 1, 2, 3 to 9, 10 different digits, uh, this thing will actually train itself very rapidly. I'm not doing anything fancy. These are trained with things called convolutional neural nets, which are far more aggressive at training this sort of a problem. I'm doing it with a basic neural network. But if you think about this, if I ask you to just run a simple regression where on the left-hand side I have a possibility of 10 numbers and on the right-hand side I have 784 columns of data, this would not really work very well because that would be a linear regression. It's not going to pick up the nonlinear features of this data. What neural networks do is do a transformation of the data through the different layers so that you get actually something that's picking up every nonlinearity. So I could run this. So I'm going to read in the data set. This is a very large data set now. Uh, large by old standards, I guess, not anymore. But, uh, and then I can reformat it. And it turns out the distribution of the digits is pretty uniform. That's the distribution of the digits from 0 to 9. And uh, that's my, my model. Now, my model here has 100 neurons at five different layers. And I'm feeding in 784 numbers. So that's getting up to about 100,000 parameters that I need to fit. Um, so if I read in the model, it's here. And now I'm going to try and fit it. Now, this will take a little bit of time, because you can see I've already run it. And each epoch is taking about 20 seconds. So we then get time to go for coffee and come back. Okay? But it's not going to take more than three, four minutes to fit this whole thing, because I'm only running 10 epochs. So I won't run it. Uh, but it's been run before. And then I can look at the confusion matrix. So the confusion matrix is just a matrix of what the true uh, digit was on the left and the actual predict on the right. And I want the diagonal of this thing to be heavy because I wanted to make very few mistakes. And that's pretty much what we're seeing. We're getting up to about 94% because I only trained it for 10 epochs. And if I do it out of sample, I'm also getting about 94%. So I'm pretty convinced that this is not overfitted. And so I'm kind of fine. What we'll do now is, I won't do the Black-Scholes one, but uh, Andrew Lowe did this 20 years ago, more than 20 years back, where he tried, tried to change, train a very simple neural network to do what the Black-Scholes model does. But if you take the entire volatility surface of all the option prices, uh, you can actually train, uh, train a neural network to, to do that. Okay, so I'm going to skip that whole thing, but I can tell you that the accuracy levels there are in super high. So I can take data from the option markets and actually teach it uh, what, the, what the option pricing rule is. Uh, so, yeah. Finally, I am going to run an algorithm which is predicting the direction of the S&P 500 index. What I'm doing is I'm going to take daily data from 1963. So every day I have all the stocks, the 500 stocks that were in the index. And so there's just 500 observations every day from 1963 onwards. And all I'm doing is saying, let me pick some days going back. So let's say I take the previous 30 days. If I take the previous 30 days and 30 into 500 stocks is about 15,000 observations. That fills out one row of my data set. And on the left-hand side, I have the next day whether the index went up or down. And this becomes nothing but the image recognition problem because I have a bunch of pixels, 15,000 of them, and I'm now just trying to train it to figure out whether tomorrow the index goes up or down. And this is really cheap. There's nothing fancy here. Just put the data in and let it run. It turns out, if I go down here, after fitting the model, uh, I've run it through a few epochs here. The number of parameters in this model is about 45,000, so it's not even a very big model. And I'm getting, this is just one random pass. 
So what I do is, because under the null hypothesis, everybody is independent, every day is independent from every, every, every other day, I can take the whole data set, randomly pick a whole bunch of days where the data is sort of all the data lined up, and then test it on the rest of them. So I replicate this experiment uh, several times. So one of these experiments gave me 54% accuracy. Now you're gonna ask me, how many times on average does the S&P 500 index go up, and how many times does it go down? Does anybody know that number? Okay, yeah, so it's about 52.7%, and I was surprised. I thought it was a lot more than that, actually, when I first thought intuitively about it, because you normally see the market going up, but, but it's only about 50-50, roughly speaking. So 54 is not good enough beyond transaction cost for one replication of the experiment, but when you do this many, many times, uh, as I've done over here, so I can actually just read in the data, and then out. It turns out I did 100 replications, and my training sample, so what I train on, I get 72% accuracy. And out of sample, the out accuracy, the mean across the 100 samples is about 69%. Okay, and hedge fund managers generally say that if you can get me to 55% or so after transaction costs, I should be able to put on a trading rule that'll do this for me. So I don't know whether I'm still playing with this, whether we're gonna have sort of a different view of market efficiency going forward because now we're worrying about whether we can predict the index, taking a whole more chunks of data than we had to do than we ever did before, and so things are, are different. Okay, so that's just the in sample, out of sample across the. This is the histogram across the hundred different uh, replications, and you can see it's definitely tilted way out to the right. So we generally tend to pick up these these patterns a lot better than we expected. Okay, so. What Numerai is doing, of course, is interesting. They're making all this data available. I've done different replications with different packages. So there's another company called H2I that provide, provides a package. I get slightly lower accuracy levels with that. And with the TensorFlow from Google, I get slightly uh, higher accuracy levels with that. OK, uh, there's plenty of this stuff on the blockchain now. Uh, people are actually solving the same problem on the blockchain. So Numerai actually provides them better data than what I have, much more data. What Numerai does is they actually cryptographically encode the data so that they can buy it from different sources and then make it available to everybody because they aren't giving them the actual data. They are, they are modifying the data and transforming it so that other people can work on the data without having their hands on the data. That's again a one-way function type application where you make huge amounts of data available to run this sort of pattern recognition algorithm and see what, what's happening. Uh, so they are funds, they started creating funds for it and uh, uh, Numerai is sort of creating, they're using homomorphic encryption, which is just a way of saying that it's a one-way function so that we can actually uh, give you data where you can actually unwrap it and get the original data back, but you can still run it. So it's, in some sense, all they're feeding you is the pixels of the image recognition problem in slightly different form and saying, here's the left-hand side, use the right-hand side to predict the left-hand side. We won't tell you what's on the right-hand side because we've, we've transformed it using homomorphic encryption, but if you can get an algorithm that really does a good job then we can unwrap it for you and use it to trade. Okay, and that's basically the idea. Okay, so let me skip all that. Uh, there's plenty of other applications that are going on. Uh, I only finished the first topic, <laughs> okay, for fintech applications, so I'll do as much as I can. The second big area is in networks. So this is something I've been working on for a long time. Uh, there's a lot of large-scale data to try and figure out what the U.S. financial system actually looks like. Okay, so after the Dodd-Frank Act came out and we'd been through the crisis, one of the big things was can we sort of measure systemic risk using technology in real time? Okay, so the idea here is how do we actually have a single number that tells you what the risk of the entire US financial system might be over time? So I worked on this project with the IBM uh, labs people near my campus and uh, we actually create, we siphoned off all the data from the SEC servers that was public record. So everything that's a filing is filed and we pull all that data down. And then we use different pieces of that data for different applications. One of the applications I want to show you is banks make loans to each other, all the money flows that go through. These are all posted as filings on the SEC website. You can download them and collect them. But it's terabytes of data, so we wrote code to pull out these loan contracts. Each of these loan contracts is about 100 pages of text, which contains all the information about the loan but we know what these loans are back and forth because we wrote code to read off all that text and pull out all the bits of data. So now we know who's lending to who for what tenor and what period of time, and from that you can construct an interbank lending network. Once you have an interbank lending network, you can plot it, and that's what it looks like in 2005 before the crisis. 
It turns out you get three big clusters of banks, but sitting in between those three clusters is Citigroup, JP Morgan, and Bank of America. If you cycled forward and looked at the networks for 2006, 2007, 8, and 9, you can see in 2006 they're getting closer. In 2007, when the crisis is hitting, everything becomes sort of like a black hole falling into itself. 2008, it's still there, but very thin. Nobody's lending to anybody anymore. And 2009, things start going back to normal. So that's sort of your, the first time we actually saw pictures of this by basically pulling large amounts of data off the SEC servers and constructing this. Now, one of the nice things about what economists have been doing over the last five, 10 years is we've been working a lot with networks and computing statistics of all these networks. So we can actually figure out who's the most important bank in that network, which is the rank ordering of these banks by that, and so on and so forth. And it turns out that you can compute different scores. So for example, you can compute R. R is nothing but the Herfindahl index of concentration. If your network is highly concentrated in a couple of nodes, then like uh, Cam showed you that picture, it's very centralized and it's, it can be easily taken down. So if one of those nodes fails, you've got a big problem. Or if there's disease on some side of the network, it can easily flow to the central node and then bring down the network as well. That's called fragility and that's that score R. It turns out that Herfindahl index that economists use is the numerator of that number. We just normalized it. The reason we normalized it because in computer science, we have this theory of expander graphs, which is exactly the same thing. And it turns out when you look at expander graphs, whether a local problem will become a global problem is a function of that number r. It turns out if it's bigger than two, local problems on a network will spread to become global. The US is 137. Okay, so we have a highly centralized banking network that is very, very susceptible to systemic risk. It goes up to 172 before the crisis, and after the crisis, it's coming down because now people aren't transacting as much as they used to. We can work out the centrality scores, which is nothing but a way of saying who's the most important person in the network. And you can see what they are. Uh, you can see Lehman Brothers is down here in 2005. And of course, when I showed this to the regulators, their first reaction was, see, we were right to let Lehman fail, because they weren't right at the top of this list. But it turns out this is only the network of interbank lending. If it was a CDS market, I'm no doubt at all that Lehman would be somewhere at the top of that list. OK, so you can do a lot of that. What we've done now with this is actually taken it and tied it up with the Merton model for credit risk. So the Merton model has been around for a long time. KMV, for example, has created a credit risk business of the Merton model. We've wrapped it up so that we can now make a Merton model drive the entire banking network. So I can fit the Merton model to each banking company. And then I can use the Merton model to get bivariate distributions of how one bank's fortunes affect another bank's fortunes and then drive the links in the network from that analogy. And once I've done that, I can then create a metric of overall credit risk. And the metric is very simple. C is just the compromise score for every bank. It's a function of the asset size A, and it's probably of default lambda. So the product of those two tells you how risky it is. And then E is the network matrix. It's one if bank I affects bank J, and the other way around. Okay, so if you just think of a network being described by an n by n matrix of n banks, then the cell ij has got one in it if i is going to cause a risk spillover on bank j. And we can compute that risk spillover using the Merton model. So we compute this thing called R. And if you look at this measure here, C is the credit risk score of each bank. E is a matrix. So this is n by n. This is 1 by n because it's transposed and it's C. So this is a scalar quantity. If the network gets more dense, R goes up. If C gets higher, higher scores are worse credit quality, R goes up as well. So this thing on the top, normalized by the assets, uh, actually gives you a score for the systemic risk score for the entire banking system, and that can be tracked over time. We can also sort of manage, uh, break it down. There's some nice properties to this risk metric, and you can actually work out the sensitivity of the risk, the systemic score for the entire system with respect to uh, the credit scores of each bank and so on. So we did this, and it turns out, if you look at over time, every six months, uh, which bank was the most likely to contribute to this risk? We can actually compute how much of each bank's contribution to risk was at any point in time. Uh, we get a whole bunch of these. And you can see in the beginning, you're getting all the mortgage-related firms like uh, Lehman, uh, FMCC, Fannie Mae, people like that. Uh, then the crisis happens, they all vanish, and now you get all the guys with the LIBOR crisis showing up uh, later in, in the systemic risk pool. 
You can also look at the entire network and say, what happens if I take one link between two banks out? How much does it reduce the score for the entire system? And you can find out which links are the most important. That's another set of those. Okay, so for example, in 2015, RBS Santander was one of the most risky links in the system. And if you took it out, we could. Okay, I'm running out of time. We did this in India. My old friend Raghu Rajan was the governor of the central bank there. So we actually implemented this in India real time. So we have pictures of which, that's the risk contributions of all the banks to the total number. The fragility score in India is just 2.91. The US was 137, if you remember, okay? So the, the system there is much more decentralized. Uh, sorry, it's 50, not, uh, uh, so yeah, no, fragility is 2.91, and that was 137 for the US. And then we can also look at the banking system here as well. We backfilled it to 2008, and you can see the blue line shows you how systemic risk in India was, was tracking over time. Okay, so I have a minute, Per. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let me see if I can just talk about something that might be, uh, let's see. Uh, I don't want to do blockchain again. <laughs> All right, so let me go back here and let me just do. Yeah, maybe I'll just talk about uh, the robo-advising thing and stay with that. Uh, so this is a big area right now that everybody's working on. Uh, the 2% cost of intermediation is high, and there are lots of problems in handling people's wealth over time. So the five big problems people are trying to work on is, first is uh, low returns. We don't have the high returns we had in the past, so how do we actually deliver the high returns people need? They've got expectations about where they're going to retire. Uh, the second thing you're trying to manage is longevity risk. There's lots of interesting work being done on very long dated forward contracts on annuities uh, called QLACs in the US. Uh, that's uh, being fitted with a bunch of uh, interesting econometric models. A lot of high volatility in different products that uh, people, people, some people want it, some people don't. Uh, we have very high cost providers which are being disintermediated. And finally, there's high inequality, which is another concern. So these, if we can handle these five things using technology, lots of different technologies happening. Uh, we've got a bunch of things in different spaces people have written about, but, uh, but by and large, we're also trying to eliminate bias, and so there's some recent work here that we've been talking about bias in lending and so on that's also being handled by technology. So technology is a good place to start with, with killing off many of these things. That's just, Barron's had this out last week, so I thought I'd grab it and put it in. Okay, but we're now getting some performance metrics on robo-advisors and what the performance of their one-year returns is, and so on and so forth. Okay, so maybe I'll just go to the end and finish up. Um, yeah, this is the blockchain stuff is interesting, uh, just to mention it. Uh, just last month, we had another hack of the Ethereum blockchain. Not a hack. It was the wallet was, had a bug in it. and uh, It was a coding error in the parity wallet. And so you could reset the, the password. You needed three, three passwords to get in to reset it. And what was interesting was they managed to get three accounts for, th for 31 million before the other hackers got in and just siphoned off all the money from the accounts to, to cloister it and then put it back in later, which was a better way to handle it than, than what, was, what happened to the first block uh, hack in Dow. OK, so let me just jump to the end. Uh, there's a bunch of things in FinTech that are being handled in different ways. One is you have a lot of garbage in, garbage out going on right now. And uh, that's really because of data quality. So there's a whole bunch of things. So, so there's a recent paper that I actually worked on with Louis Alexander, who's the chief economist of Nomura, just talking about data cleansing. About 80% of the work in FinTech, at least for a lot of finance houses that use data, is, is data cleansing. Uh, there are a bunch of interesting startups that are handling that problem right now with AI, uh, putting databases together and so on. Uh, you have information overload. That's been a huge problem because people are taking too much data and finding the signal in that noise is becoming harder and harder. One way to fix that is to actually use theoretical, theoretical models first. But the other way to fix it is actually to compress data uh, through dimension reduction. Uh, there was a conference at Berkeley a few months back where the entire four days was just on how do you take large data sets, bring them down to size that can run on one machine, retaining about 95% of the properties of the data. And that's the sort of stuff I think we'll be seeing a lot more in finance. Uh, bigger is not better, same thing again. Big data, this is Taleb's critique that uh, becomes harder to find the needle in a bigger haystack. Uh, there are lots of technology responses to that. TDA is the one that banking, the banking sector is sort of working a lot on right now. There's a firm called Ayasi that came out of Stanford. 
it's called, it's using topology because every data point of somebody who's got 3,000, let's say, characteristics uh, is a point in 3,000 dimensional space. And you get these large point clouds and you have a lot of nice topology that works on these point clouds to give you uh, results that, uh, that can be used to get detection of fraud and so on and so forth. Uh, correlation with causality is another problem. Uh, and all that's happening right now in industry is people are putting tighter review cycles. For example, if I fit this algorithm to trade the S&P index, how do I know it's gonna keep working properly? So I've got to keep retraining at a very tight uh, retraining cycles, and that's something that people are working together on. Uh, there's a lot of in, in, in expensive infrastructure. Not everybody can afford it, so the big guys are definitely an advantage. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of things happening in the customer space where chatbots, there's a huge shortage of chatbot, uh, chatbot writers in the finance industry. So there's a huge investment taking place right now in actually building better chatbots, and it's been kind of interesting to watch that as well. Okay, so I'm going to Great. stop for, sorry for running well, over. Well, yeah, no, thank you. Uh, we could have, uh, we should give, give yeah, you yeah. three hours, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'll start with sort of a, 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 a more general question, a big picture question, uh, and let me uh, direct this to Anna first. So, I guess fintech is this sort of vague word. It's a lot of different things, you know, in, in all sorts of different areas. Anna, what would you say are the biggest ways which technology is changing finance right now? If you had to pick, you know, the two, three biggest changes we're, we're facing right now in the finance industry, what would you Well, I would, would say pick? that um, the, the value chains are, are changing due to digitalization um, in three ways. Uh, number one, the value chains are being digitalized, and we heard about AI, you can apply it on personalization, operational effectiveness, use, huge effects, uh, but also uh, robotic advice, um, reg tech and, 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 and block tech. But number two, middle hands are being slashed. Mm -hmm. So we see peer Relating to, to what Cam also mentioned, the, the, the death right. of the middle, middle right. person, I would so say. So it's a new type of digitalized trust. Yeah. <laughs> we can mm -hmm. see that we risk assess our peers mm -hmm. going forward. Mm -hmm. So the new bank clients, they are very keen on individual, individualized and personalized offers, but they want to be in, on collective platforms. Mm. Number three, uh, we mentioned that as well, it's a, a, a networked value chain. So you need to really identify which part of your value chain is going to be attacked, <laughs> where mm. you have to partner up. Mm. So. If you look at the different segments, that was your question, mm. different segments or on the banking offers, if you have payments, lending, savings, and insurance, uh, the entry barriers are, are different due to three things. It's trust, technology, and shifts in, mm. in regulation. Mm. Mm. So that what we see is technologies, we go from very technology or consumer driven um, fintech um, mm -hmm. offerings. Uh, due to more technology and operational mm. uh, fintech um, disruption. Mm. So, mm. And, and that makes it even harder to have that push mm. inside a, a traditional institution, mm. financial mm. institution. Mm. But so, yeah. finally, the gains. Mm. <laughs> because as an economist, it's, it's crucial that we really embrace digitalization in the fintech <laughs> sector. Um, because it's democratizing finance. Mm -hmm. It is that the cost savings and operational effectiveness mm -hmm. are, are huge. And also we see a different kind of engagement, a, a shift of power of transparency, co-creation, mm -hmm. using idle capital, mm -hmm. matching them to, mm -hmm. to small savings. Mm -hmm. so, so it's a really a, a mm -hmm. positive approach, yet we need mm -hmm. sustainability mm -hmm. yeah. and also need knowledge to steer AI. But I, that's really I think yeah, we, we're going to, I mean, come back to that because I think it's important. <coughs> you know, the, there are benefits and there are risks, right. but let's get back uh, uh, there in a the, in the minute. So I guess you've been talking a lot about, you know, the changing value chains and the cutting of the middleman. I guess we'll ask the middleman uh, himself. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, are, so at Tandespan, how do you view uh, what's happening now in technology and finance and, and, and what are you kind of focusing on uh, right now? Uh, and um, I think you have, of course, absolutely right. I think the whole value chain is uh, right now breaking up um, and 
discussing fintech is of course i mean we had some angles here you have 10 points here but you which are ex extremely valid mm -hmm. uh, but you have that totally different angles how you can ad address this and uh, but i think the focal point about what's happening with the technology in this industry now is is really concentrated around data because i mean i think the the finance industry is probably the one that has been most ruined by data over in the past mm -hmm. before all this fintech stuff came up mm -hmm. and i think the the finance industry was was pretty good in, in making use and creating value out of data. Mm. Then, of course, we have some issues in there, middlemen, mm. uh, high margins in some areas, which are now, of course, mainly addressed by these new companies. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if there's one thing that is driving this or makes it uh, possible for, us, for technology to create more value and, mm -hmm. and take out operational costs and mm -hmm. so on, it's around these data strength models. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I said, I'm coming from the, from the telco industry. And I always take this example with the SMS services, mm. yeah, which was uh, a very old-fashioned service, but the margins were, were barely legal that the telco operators were, were earning. And this was, of course, the point where then WhatsApp and, and another mm. companies came in. We're using technology to create a lot of customer value mm. and taking out a lot of margin mm. from, from the mm. middlemen, mm. Uh, the, the telco operators. Mm. And, and I, I think this is also what, what we're, of course, looking for. We mm. are trying to understand better what is our part in this value mm -hmm. chain? Where do we think that we have a competitive edge mm -hmm. going forward? Mm -hmm. uh, where are the profit pools or margin mm -hmm. pools that are under under strong mm -hmm. attack? Um, and how can we then work together with fintechs mm -hmm. to to use the benefits? Mm -hmm. Where I think actually the the industry, the finance industry, ha has learned a lot mm -hmm. from the transformations that were mm -hmm. happening in the media industry, mm -hmm. in the telco industry, where it was much more a fight mm -hmm. against each other. Mm -hmm. Uh, with a lot of winners, a lot of losers. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in the what I see at least happening right now with this uh, fintech hubs and these collaborations ongoing, mm -hmm. I think um, the complexity here, not that much from a technological point of view, mm -hmm. but from the regulative point mm -hmm. of view, is mm -hmm. so big that a lot of fintechs have understood that uh, it's not that easy to become the Facebook mm -hmm. in the finance industry right. or the Google in the finance industry. On the other hand, there are a lot of pretty good solutions mm -hmm. that you can use that, uh, that it's much better to do this together with the banks mm -hmm. to help them to address this mm -hmm. than trying to become the, the big uh, mm -hmm. player here. Mm -hmm. You mentioned um, uh, security, yeah? because I think there's some things like security and, uh, and trust that are where the value is a little higher when we talk about money than when we're talking about my messages that yeah. I'm sending to my kids. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think it's um, it's it's a much more open and much more mm -hmm. constructive discussion mm -hmm. I think between us as the banks yeah. and and the the guys that have the good ideas. I mean, uh, just as a something I'm I'm thinking about uh, as you as you as you talk about this. So it sounds like you you think that the you know banking and Handelsbank's business is going to kind of look different, let's say, in 10 years from now, because there are going to be certain areas where you see you have a comparative advantage. There are going to be other areas where you may. You know, not having a particular uh, advantage, and maybe that's taken over by other players. Um, I'm just curious. I mean, Handelsbanken is well known to be, I mean, super successful bank historically, but also one of the more conservative, uh, strong culture type banks. So, is this a strength or a weakness? You think in this <laughs> changing well, uh, environment? Actually, me, you're the wrong guy <laughs> to ask, I guess. Yeah, so somehow, Your bosses <laughs> aren't here. Somehow, but somehow I'm exactly the right guy to ask yeah. because I, I made an active decision to join this company yeah. one year ago, um, and I believe that it's it's more strength. Of course, it mm -hmm. depends on how we can use this strength. Mm -hmm. But I think the the roots of this company, which are very decentralized, which are very people focused, mm -hmm. and uh, talking about innovation. I mean, if you see if you see at the the way that apps that we are that also Handelsbank mm -hmm. has embraced the technologies that make sense for our mm -hmm. users and not our only nice gimmicks, like you had some yeah. examples here. Yeah. Uh, we are not behind that. Yeah. Yeah? Um, so from that perspective, I, I absolutely believe that we have a, a huge opportunity here mm. to, to make use of this technology in a way that creates value for mm. our customers and not only in a, well, in a way that it creates uh, big headlines in the news. Mm. Mm. So Sarah, um, I guess you're, you have insights from several angles on this, I think, because on the one hand, you've been working a lot in sort of, let's call it traditional finance and insurance and pensions. Um, and, but now you're also on the board of one of the, you know, people who are actually entering, the new entrants in this business, Klarna. Um, so what's your view on this, uh, you know, how traditional finance is, is changing, the most uh, important changes? Uh, well, I, I mean, I think w we could go to the uh, things that you were talking about, Sanjeev, that, 
you know, we already knew that chimpanzees were better than people at stock picking. And now we found out that machines are better than chimpanzees, you know, so. Um, it's chimpanzees, <laughs> finance professors, and uh, analysts. Yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, seriously speaking, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think if you, sp I spent 35 years in various areas of the financial sector, and basically, I believe the whole business model is terminating. Uh -huh. But it will take a long time. Uh -huh. um, and I think fundamentally, it's it's when I read Sanjeev's presentation, you're looking at it from a tech point. But if you if you come at it, which does not contradict anything that you say from the other end, and say that it starts in a different place, where it says, how can I attract a lot of customers and keep them? That's the only thing on your mind. Besides, you, maybe in the beginning, you're also making losses. Your shareholder value isn't even in your mind for like 10 years. And um, and how can I do it as fast as possible? Uh, and, and of course, adjusting to, and you're also looking really basically at millennials to start with. So you're not even thinking about, you know, I have to be all my customers. Now, some people would say that means you don't have a flat playing field, but I actually think it just means the whole business will change. It's like the Polaroid thing. Um, because even now, I mean, Clarence is 10 years old. Even now, we don't talk in board meetings about regulation very much, only what's essential. And I'm chairman of the <laughs> committee, so I, yeah. I know that we're doing the right things. Um, but we talk a lot about how to attract customers and keep them, and what will we do when we're disrupted? What's the next disruption? How do we keep moving? So we're trying to move around all those spaces. And I know that's not what is done in the board meetings of the conventional institutions, because I've been there, unless everything has changed in the last 18 has, months. Has Clarina, gone, has, has Clarina gone from being, oh, we are like the hot new entrant, to like, oh, now we're the incumbent, and these new entrants are like chopping away our business? No, I think it's just um, <laughs> the, the tech piece of it, yeah. which you were talking about too, Cam, you know that blockchain, we, we use a lot of mm. artificial intelligence for fraud and credit mm. decisioning. If you, if you mm. take any credits with Klarna, you probably know that. Um, but the blockchain piece of it will change part of it. And, mm. and therefore, you have to keep thinking. I think another thing is your identity. You think... Um, you don't think I'm uh, now Klarna is a bank, we're a bank, and we're a modern bank. You don't think like that at all. You say, what could we not do? Mm. What could someone else do better? Mm. Let's buy that mm. from them. Mm. That's a totally different way of thinking. Mm. And then finally, the other totally way of thinking, I think no matter what bank or pension institution or asset manager you go to, the IT division is the back office. It's, it might even have advanced to the middle office. Mm -hmm might sit in the in the management, but it might not even be a techie person at the top. Mm -hmm. Here it's the integral piece of it. In fact, the risk capitalists are always saying, you know, you can never get beneath 50% of your employees being en in engineering. Mm. Now, whether that's the magic <laughs> number or not, I don't know, but it's this respect for that it is the tech machine that's going to make it possible for you to delight your customers. Mm -hmm. That's a different way of thinking and therefore I think we I mean obviously some of the incumbents will adapt but their cultures are totally not there mm -hmm. and um, even today mm -hmm. so they might adapt in pieces of it mm -hmm. and I think that's true if I look at my other assignment in conventional asset management that there's so much to disrupt there I mean like you were talking about analysts mm -hmm. um, Basically, I would, ex if I were an asset manager today, I would just want to use AI to look at, if I were a stock picker mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for all stocks, and I would want it to be transparent and available mm -hmm. to me, and I might like to even interactively build my own little <laughs> algorithms, maybe mm -hmm. not mathematical ones, but my ideas mm -hmm. coming from another end, even if I were a fundamentalist. Mm -hmm. And we're still using analysts, mm -hmm. and we're still attached to our little mm -hmm. investment bank mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. and. Um, so there's tons still to happen, but I don't have a lot of faith. I think, you know, Apple, mm. maybe they're getting to, you know, fat and middle-aged, mm. but Apple and, and Facebook, Google might mm. be the big banks. Certainly it's mm. not going to come from an incumbent. I don't mm. think so. Mm -hmm. Sanjay, I mean, I'm going to turn to you on soon, but just want to ask, so are, are, do you talk a lot to the sort of the established yeah. players? <laughs> are they scared or do they... Uh, <laughs> Uh -huh. We talk a lot about the data. I think I'm scared of getting started with this as well. Uh -huh. So, so I, I think the big choice is also whether to build it yourself or buy off these startups uh -huh. and start slowly you know, 
wrapping them in. Mm -hmm. I don't know about the blockchain space, you mm -hmm. probably know better what banks eventually do. But we've had these consortia in the blockchain space that have had their ups and downs. Mm -hmm. And in the payment space, for example, it's very clear that people are not building their own. They're buying up a bunch of stocks. Mm -hmm. That's definitely what mm -hmm. we've seen. Goldman is buying a ton of a businesses, of payment, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. people out there that are all doing it. In fact, they totally, payments are not going through banks anymore. So in some sense, <coughs> in India, we had a big demonetization about a, less than a year back. Mm -hmm. And they just pulled all the big notes out and everybody mm -hmm. was stuck. And so it mm -hmm. just forced us to go on with phone-based payments. And it mm -hmm. happened mm -hmm. overnight. There was no bank involved. Mm -hmm. It just mm -hmm. happened completely out of mm -hmm. outside of the bank. Mm -hmm. So there will be different areas over here that mm -hmm. will be I think done through a startup ecosystem, mm -hmm. and the, there'll be other mm -hmm. areas that will come mm -hmm. from in house mm -hmm. building of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, in the robot, I think, for example, yes, there have been Betterman and Wealthfront, a good mm -hmm. example of startups that became very good. Mm -hmm. But in this area of what's called goal based investing, every major house is doing an internal, mm -hmm. internal platform mm -hmm. for goal based mm -hmm. investing. So, so it's happening mm -hmm. at a high degree. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I guess it's yeah. kind of going to be yeah. you know, different yeah. uh, as you go across these different areas. So, you won. Um, your firm invests in these the, the new entrants, I guess, or people mm -hmm. coming up with the new uh, technology. And I and I guess you've already you saw that then six six years ago or more, yeah, right? Yeah. That this was was happening. So, what's your uh, view? Where where are the biggest opportunities you think as an investor? Uh, but uh, I, I think that uh, first of all, I think that if if you look on a sector wise, it's probably business to business solutions that is mm -hmm. that we see is much much stronger. Uh, consumer products is extre extremely expensive to build because mm -hmm. you need a lot of marketing capacity into those. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, banking is not sexy, so it's not mm -hmm. that like music where everyone runs to. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it's it's uh, we we have not a all the there. cool young programmers want to work in banks? Yeah, not all of them, but okay. some. <laughs> We're lucky for that. But yeah. otherwise, uh, I think we have a struggle there. So I would say business to business is better and stronger because it's easy for us to, to uh, roll out on an international scale. Mm -hmm. It's also easy because you have less customers mm -hmm. that you could attract and, and knock on the door and, and get them on board. So when you say business to business, you're talking about, uh, um, uh, you know, two firms in the financial industry interacting or are exactly. you thinking about like lending to firms rather no, it, than it could be both that and a very good example of that is a company we have which is uh, NodeCop it's a mm -hmm. treasury system for real estate companies mm -hmm. they have approximately 80% of the real estate uh, companies within their books today which means that we actually see more data than the banks does mm -hmm. we can actually make better decisions than the banks can in, in terms of that mm -hmm. what we're doing now is that because the banks in, in the Nordics makes too much money um, <laughs> of course they need Need to give it out as dividend to their shareholders. Mm -hmm. That's the explanation, which mm -hmm. is quite strange. <laughs> but anyway, they make a lot of money. So what we do now is that we take the pension capital and we connect it directly to our platform. Mm -hmm. So we go outside the banking system, and instead of paying a minus 60 basis point, which is which is the bond market today, if you look on housing, mm -hmm. we can give them maybe 50, 60 basis points, which mm -hmm. means that they, they actually go from minus 60 to plus 60, which is quite high leap in terms of yield, mm -hmm. and also especially when it's more or less a risk-free mm -hmm. asset. Not Woods, but mm -hmm. so that we see a lot of things. We actually see Klarna as an incumbent player in our field. I think we have three or four or five maybe companies that are competing towards those kind of volumes that Klarna is taking. Mm -hmm. What we see as, as a very, very clear trend within our company is that they work according to the principle of relevance, mm -hmm. not simplicity as the banking and comp incumbent players, such as all big players in the market. Because if you look on all banking, if we look on all our banking offerings that we have today here, mm -hmm. it's more or less the same. It's the same except for the color of the credit card, which mm -hmm. is different. Mm -hmm. What we think is that you can't, you can't divide the market that, you need to start digging it that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, that means also to the fact that you will become much more relevant, as I said, you will be much more, how to say, interesting to the customer base, mm -hmm. which leads to the fact that you could charge higher mm -hmm. fees and, higher, and, and create higher margin. So what we believe is actually that the banking market as such will increase the profit pool mm -hmm. if they don't go towards the telcos, which I think is going totally in the wrong direction mm -hmm. today. And all the incumbent banks are doing that as well, because simplicity is the only drive they have. I mean, hearing this, this sort of views, and it's interesting to have <laughs> Stefan here, feeling like constantly under attack. But I mean, when you... No, but we, we don't, we don't yeah. attack the banks yeah, because yeah. we think that yeah. we need to work together. No, together. exactly. Yeah. I mean, will is this making... Because I think about Handelsbanken, right? It's kind of the, the, the one bank that actually still has some offices, you know, where you can actually talk to a human being and so on, right? Um, so is this... Uh, do you think there's a future to kind of humans <laughs> in finance? 
you know, is there going to be a backlash? I mean, we, this is not a new development, I guess, because we talked about banking starting to, you know, instead of having relationship lending, they do scoring models, push a button and get a credit score and decide whether you get the loan rather than, you know, do they like you and do you wear a Hells Angels vest or whatever. But, but, um, but take the but so, yeah. Just, yeah. just one, one comment on that. I mean, DMB closed 50% of the branch network within a year. Not one single customer complaint. Right, right. So, so I don't know. I mean, Stefan, what do you do? You feel it's sort of a yeah, I feel constantly under attack. That's yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> Not by uh, us. No, yeah. but uh, of course, I think the the traditional banking model, of course, is under. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't say under attack, but it's of mm -hmm. course challenged. Mm -hmm. But if you see what happened during the last years, mm -hmm. uh, I mean. It, the way that people interact with the bank, if you only take this interaction thing, mm -hmm. it has, of course, changed totally. Yeah. And I mean, everybody's do most of their banking stuff mm -hmm. via digital tools, mm -hmm. which are provided by the banks mm -hmm. and not by Facebook mm -hmm. or some other players. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, the banks, and especially in the Nordics, and uh, as you probably hear, I'm, I'm from Germany, if you just compare the, the banking interactions in Germany and Sweden, it's, it's, it's like day and night. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the Scandinavian banks are extremely good in... Uh, adopting mm. to new technology mm. and offering this to their customers. Mm. So uh, from that perspective, uh, of course, it has changed mm. a lot during the last years and it will change uh, going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, but coming to the, to the, of course, for us, most important question, what, is about, what about human interaction? Mm -hmm. Because we are yeah, probably the only bank here in Scandinavia that is really uh, keeping the branch office mm. because we believe that there's a, a value that you can deliver to your customers on top of all these uh, standardized tools. That means, of course, in the back office, in the middle office, a lot of has to, mm -hmm. uh, has to change. Mm. Uh, but we believe that, there, that our customers will be humans mm -hmm. also in the future. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about <laughs> IoT. Uh, for, the close of, for the close of future. And we mm -hmm. believe that... I thought it was going to be machines <laughs> talking to machines. Yeah, yeah that's, we were also looking at this, but uh, for, for now... And we'd be lying down with like <laughs> in some <laughs> basins. For now, we, we see, and also coming back to your comment that in, uh, in Norway nobody complained. If you look at the customer satisfaction numbers from DNB, they fell down like like a stone. But uh, what happened when you closed 10% of the branches mm. last year in Sweden? Yeah, it was similar. Uh, and now <laughs> we're coming to the question, what, uh, what about correlations? Yeah. Uh, because, of course, you can always pick one, yeah. uh, one action and see what exactly would happen no. with that. Um, but coming back to my point, I think we still have want to deal with people. Mm. Mm. And, of course, we have to, to offer as much as possible in the digital channels mm -hmm. where it makes sense. But we also believe that there's a sense that it makes, that there's a value that you mm -hmm. as a human can deliver. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the decisions we are taking as humans mm -hmm. are, of course, extremely rational. Mm -hmm. So, so Anna, Anna, you had a question. Yeah, no, no, that was no, a, a robot just a here. No, yes. I think it's very interesting that the discussion <laughs> about the, the, the job loss yeah. or the, the net effect, if it could be positive. I agree. Finance is emotional mm. business. And if you look at what AI does, it will replace a lot yeah. of jobs. But most of the jobs that are very repetitive and very easy to forecast. Uh, so there's a lot of tasks that are not easy mm. to forecast when it comes to human mm -hmm. interactions. And there's emotion and gut feeling mm. when it comes to investment mm. decisions. Mm. But there will be more, there will be jobs being created mm. that we haven't heard of mm -hmm. today. When it comes to AI, AI, you have to adapt the organization and also talent skills to mm -hmm. prepare for this. First, it's trainers. Mm -hmm. When you talk about AI, it's about training humans to interact with AI, but training AI to be more like humans. Mm -hmm. So you can train, like, what, what would you say that uh, AI could predict when it comes to, to, to sarcasm? <laughs> what percentage? Mm -hmm. Do you have any clue? Like a sarcasm <laughs> in in an email. Are, are you allow, allowed to mus, use emojis? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, so that, that's eighty percent. So it's pretty much. But yeah. anyway, so that's one new job creation mm. field: trainers. Mm. Right? Mm. We need that for some time going forward. And then we have the the explainers. So you have to really explain to CEOs and CTOs and CMOs how you're going to adapt your your value chain and your, your organization to, to AI. Mm. And the third one, I think, is the most important. It's the sustainers. Um, you have to have a compliance ethic officer. Uh, in, and you have to make AI steerable. So there's a, you know, GDPR. I think a lot of fintechs are underestimating the cost associated to compliance and, and integrity. Because there, when you showed 
as this black box of AI, and there, there's actually a law on the right to explanation. So as a bank client, I could demand an explanation of this algorithm. There's a lot of resources that's going to be needed for that kind of control and sustainment. Right. So I am positive that we will, the net effects of jobs could be positive, but there's a, there's new skills mm. that we have to adapt to. I mean, turning into costs and benefits and, and humans, um, the, I mean, one other issue too, right, is, is um, we as, as people are now interacting more and more with machines, okay, if we take ourselves as, as bank customers and so on. Uh, I guess, is this good or, or bad? Are there some, uh, some risks there or are there... And, yeah, well, Sarah I mean, that's, uh, if I ask everyone in this room, do you think it's life was better with or without your smartphone? <laughs> uh, that's that's where I am on that question. Mm -hmm. I would much rather, in many cases, and I and I do believe that the efficient kind of physical office that, for example, Hans Banken offers, where I have worked, so I'm very biased, um, might survive in some form. But I would much rather interact with a robot. For example, how many people would rather use a bank mall, you know, an ATM, than go into a, a teller in the mm. United States in particular, if I may say so? Um, <laughs> I think we're going to be interacting with machines, and I think mm. we're going to love it. Mm. Uh, that's my actual conclusion. But, but that doesn't mean uh, that... One, that all jobs will disappear, there will be different jobs, you'll have to be much more skilled to be in a, in a tel physical office, obviously, than they are today. Um, you, I, I doesn't mean that all decisions, I mean, there will be elements, for example, uh, but I would also, I think one of the really interesting things is what's going to happen to the legal sector. Um, for example, when you buy a house or someone mm. dies in your family, mm. just to have all of that mm. streamlined because really you don't know how to read the fine print. Mm. Um, so if you knew there was a machine checking that, and right. there will be errors just like there is in everything, but, but basically we could be talking about the home that we are going to buy or the person who has deceased mm. with our banker, mm. with, our, with whomever mm. we need to interact mm. with, with our machine. Mm. So I, I'm pretty certain that we yeah. are going to be using machines and I, I don't feel any fear about it. I think it's right. absolutely going to relieve us of a lot of incompetence. So, and I would like to add to that yeah. that let us not forget that the financial sector brought the entire world to its knees once in 1926, mm -hmm. 29, and once again. Um, so there have been a lot of costs to the m business models and the ways in mm. which we've built up the financial sector based on shareholder value and fees, basically. How can we take as much fees as possible? Mm. And I do not blame anybody for that mm. particular. It's just the nature of the business as it's built. But so we're talking about a sector that might be much more adapted to giving objective information and letting you take control whether you're a professional or an individual of okay, so, financial so, so let me be the grumpy, uh, uh, what's the, Luddite is the word, no? Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, two, two examples, okay? Right. So one is when you, when you, uh, uh, you know, anyone who's been browsing the web, you all of a sudden see, you know, you, you googled, whatever, sweater, okay, five minutes ago, and then you go on some newspaper website and you see all these ads for sweaters coming up. Okay. But you get now, a girl in a sweater. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> so um, right? Yeah, exactly. But the, um, uh, so finance is like a, a place where we know uh, it's quite easy to manipulate individuals yeah. because yeah. these are products we don't quite understand. You know, they have long-term consequences <laughs> and so on. So, I mean, isn't there a worry that technology will make it more easy to kind of take advantage of us as customers? Uh, that's the first one. And the second one, maybe, uh, uh, you know, thinking about Sanjay, right, is you talked about the financial crisis and, and how the old business models are obsolete. But there are some, at least, explanations or contributors to the financial crisis that actually have to do with technology, right? I'm thinking already in 87, it was program trading, okay? I'm thinking about your algorithms, crowded mm. trades, you know, algorithms, everyone doing the same thing at the same time because there are no humans, it's just technology. No, so but I, I don't know, is, yeah, is it any... It's, any uh, it's not paradise, obviously, but, yeah. but I, I think that... Um, First of all, 
having better transparency will lead to better price competition. Mm -hmm. So, and, and at least some of the things that uh, Cam was saying says to me that it will be easier to detect criminality. So I think that sounded very optimistic to me and, and certainly fraud. I mean, people wonder what Klarna's business is. Certainly a large portion mm -hmm. of it is AI for fraud mm -hmm. detection, much, much bigger than mm -hmm. you would ever, Im and certainly than I would ever mm -hmm. imagine. Mm -hmm. and, and so um, as we improve that, we will have a better and healthier financial sector, but mm -hmm. obviously there will be pitfalls on the road. Any but, other? Yes. Yeah, but I think want? also that, that regarding your sweater, I think actually if you combine that with financial data, how you search on the internet and, and, and so on, you could actually become much more relevant. So I'm coming back to that. Uh, because, I mean, if, if I was searching for, for trips to Australia, mm -hmm. but if you had access to my finance, you could see that I can, can't afford going to Australia. So why should you give me ads on Australia? It doesn't mm -hmm. make sense. But you Unless know, you have a credit collection agency. Oh, no, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, 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 or, or if, if, I mean, but I travel to Spain once every, every year. So then you should... Uh, add that instead. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you can be, create much, much more stronger message and mm -hmm. don't take advantage, actually become more relevant towards the customer base and actually trigger much more or higher efficiency in, the, mm -hmm. in that kind of industry as well. Mm -hmm. yes, but I think re regarding integrity, I think you have to give the consumer or the cl bank client the choice. Of because course. Mm -hmm. if you have default detection mm -hmm. or, or predictions, it's, it's about getting really close to your private mm -hmm. behavior and you have to put that in that decision in the hands mm -hmm. of the, the bank mm -hmm. but also I think that data is a, it, it will be a currency going forward so you have to really uh, there I, I foresee that the, the bank clients will will mm -hmm identify the, the value of our behavior mm. and kind of trade that mm. to, 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 to different yeah. actors. Like owning your own data like Cam. Uh, okay, um, any uh, questions uh, or thoughts from the audience? Yes, we have one there. Uh, mm -hmm. Sanjay, did you so want to? Actually, I, I'll take it one step further, because right now we're all very comfortable <coughs> with using different apps on our phones for different things that we want to do. All these apps are going to sit on top of blockchains, and we're already seeing that happening. So if you want a healthcare product, you go onto some blockchain and an app. So Ethereum, for example, could then basically have apps. You can develop the app and put it on the Ethereum blockchain. Now the entire payments environment and the banking environment around that, the financial environment around the app, which has something to do with the physical medical provision, is already taken care of. So we might just find a whole bunch of apps. And you're right, we won't need the holding company anymore at, at all. We might actually just have an entire ecosystem of people building apps that sit on top of blockchains and providing services. You know, at the end of the day, even the medical people who provide those services will be hooking into the app. And so you get an app, somebody who's using the app, and there's somebody who's supplying the stuff into the app. And the person who builds the app doesn't even have to be one of those two. I, uh, you know, so, so you can get, you might get a completely advanced version of that ecosystem pretty quickly. As I, well. I have a slightly different view on that because I don't think that yeah. people want more apps because we have like hundreds and hundreds of apps in our phones. So what I think is rather is that you will have, a, if you look on the ecosystem of, 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 the, of the chain, you will have one customer interface level. That could be the telcos, it could be the banks, it could be whoever that has a very strong customer interaction. That brand has the app where you interact, then you connect underneath into that system with different kind of solutions that fits your, your needs towards your customer behavior, whatever it might be. Because you can't have 100 different banking apps because it will not work. And I mean, if you look on how you use your phone today, maybe you have 100 apps, but you use like five or 10 of them daily. It's like the, that Chinese, the, same, yeah. the Chinese model, Exactly, right? exactly. Yeah. Like we pay and those kind of solutions is probably where we'll see more. Where you combine things and then you buy services from service provider, which could be the banks or, or companies like Klarna or the startup environment, and you combine them into that, that environment. I, I think you have a very good point. And I, I honestly believe that it, conceptually speaking, that's exactly where you're headed, even though maybe 
one brand might have one piece that's very techy, but or have the uh, competency to purchase tech uh, uh, services. So I, I think that's absolutely a scenario. Exactly. Yeah. Correct. The, the best example today, if you look on the banking environment today, is actually the savings banks. Because you have Swedbank as a huge factory, and then you have the customer interface in terms of the savings bank on front. In top of that, that, that is like a clear example of today in that. Then Swedbank should open up their interfaces, but that's a different story. Yeah. Stefan, I mean, you've, you've been, I guess banks talk a lot about, you know, value coming from owning the customer, right? And is this, uh, would you be the guys in the future who will own the customer? So and then uh, have all these service providers paying you to uh, sell stuff to your customers. And I think this this value chain discussion is, is exactly right. But I think we we, are not, we cannot only look in the, the value chain within the finance industry. Mm -hmm. Because like you said before, I think mm -hmm. fine, this is not very sexy. And to be honest, I think most customers, and it's, uh, it's maybe not that popular, but people don't want a mortgage. They, they want a house. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an enabling. Yeah. We are an enabling industry. And uh, I think... We are not really aware of that, but technology will push us there. And I think WeChat is just one example. Nobody cares about how the who's handling the flow behind it. It's I want to make this transaction. Mm. And I think there are some banks that have understood and also looking into what happened in the telco and media industry. I think some banks have understood that, okay, I have to improve my own value chain with playing with the right uh, partners and so on. But if I really want to stay relevant for my customers going forward, I have to understand what are they doing with their money? Looking into healthcare, looking into real estate, looking into transportation, and so on. And I think th these are discussions that, uh, and that's probably also the reason why there's uh, some exchange between industries right now. Uh, people from other industries are joining this here because I think this is the, the real discussion we as an industry have to take. Which yeah. role will we mm. go playing uh, going forward to, to in the lives of our customers mm -hmm. in, for the consumers and on the See, the, the, that, that model will only work if it's cheap. WeChat works because a wrapper is pretty much costless. Yeah. If you get a bank holding company that's still trying to take you know, 100 basis points for the whole thing, it's not going to work because eventually somebody's going to put it together much cheaper. And the power so, ba you know, so balance. It's really a matter of cost in the end. Mm -hmm. and that's, you know, and the pa yeah. power balance between them will be the customer ownership, which is, which is the customer interface level, and then you have the volumes on the back. Mm -hmm. So the service provider owns the volume, which they aggregate from more parties than one, and, and the interface has the customer relations. So there you have a power balance which makes it sustainable as well. How do you capture the customer? Who, who do, how do you become the. Is it the. What's like, I guess in the, in the in ECA it used to be coffee, you know, okay. Or it's the gas station model, right? You get gas and then you start buying stuff in Google's the, in the store. It. Google's already doing it. It's yeah. captured a whole bunch of customers by yeah. offering an yeah. ecosystem of stuff. I guess in a wrapper form. Right. Banks right? traditionally, at least in Sweden, did it yeah. through mortgages, right? That's yeah. how you get your customers. But how is it uh, now when you have, can get a mortgage off some site and you compare 15 different providers and so on? I think the, the big question will, yeah. so it will be who's, who's taking care about my financial life mm. <clears throat> and, and with, with all the things that I do with the financials, the saving for the future, taking mm. care of my health care, uh, taking care of my uh, everyday spendings mm. to improve that. And I think these are the roles where I think it will be extremely interesting mm. to see who is positioning themselves there mm -hmm. as a trusted partner mm -hmm. with the right integrity, mm -hmm. with a transparent model about what kind of fees I take for this, uh, using technology of, of mm. course to make it as, as easy to interact mm. with, as transparent, as safe, uh, and, and I think this is uh, the big, the mm -hmm. big question for the future: mm -hmm. Who's owning this? Mm -hmm. Who's the trusted partner for mm -hmm. my personal mm -hmm. finance? But it's not only the trusted mm -hmm. partner; it's also the, the brand that you feel connected to. Mm. That would be extremely important mm. because if you're connected to a brand, the acquisition cost will be extremely low. Mm. And I want to well, where you position yourself, you could say that everyone wants to be this one point of entry and have all these apps on their their platforms, but it could be a situation where you become the commodity pro provider. If you look at the mm. Ålandsbanken and Dreams partnership strategy, you reach suddenly a whole different kind mm -hmm. of client segment. So there's not one solution that every 
one should strive against mm. owning client mm. transaction mm. data mm. Or, or behavior. Mm. You really have to look into your poor, core benefits. Mm. And, and in this case, with all I'm spiking mm. and, and dreams, I think it's a really successful mm. relationship with a clear win win. Mm -hmm. I think I'm, I'm sort of tangent to that. I, I think the whole concept of owning my customer is the wrong way to start because you want to say the customer owns me, I the provider. The, and if you have that attitude and you have something that works, I mean, let's face it, the reason Apple reached the size it did is because its, its devices work very, very well and they're superior in their functionality. And, you know, that the tech people love to ha hear that. But... But it is actually true that people innovate in the accessibility, in the in in the ease of use, and in something that speaks to me as a customer. Apple doesn't own me; mm. I own my phone. Mm. Mm. And um, I think we saw a disruption like that with Av Avanza in Sweden that broke up the entire institutional trading mm. market in a matter of about three or four years mm. by cost, but also because the screens are very good, mm. and because it works. It happens, and the T plus three is is. Um, destroyed. So I, I think, and, and that's what, why a physical solution can also work. If it's as fast, it's easy to use, I'm in control, you're actually going to retain it. So I think, the, I, don't, I really hate that idea of how am I going to own the customer, and maybe that's what they talk about in customers. Well, yeah. data yeah. is the new gold. So you have to, have, <laughs> yeah. you have, to be, have access to the client database behavior. <laughs> right. To make the customer want to stay right. with you. I mean, you right. don't own them, you, you delight them. I mean, that's a kind of a cliche, but it's mm. fact. Mm. But you, you, can, you can get customer data from vendors now as well. So Axiom is a big aggregator and you can pull data as well from there. Mm. So, mm. so I don't know if you need to own the customer to get their data. You mm. can probably get yeah. it without owning them. In fact, the you UK know? banks, so, yeah. I think, are, are now making available yeah. all their APIs next yeah. year. Yeah. So everybody can have all their data. So I think we have to uh, break this very interesting discussion now. And I think we should thank uh, both the presenter and the panelists with a, with a big hand. <laughs>